Hello, we, we wait a few minutes to, to allow people to, uh, to join and then we will, we will formally start in a few, in a few minutes. <clears throat> okay, there are still lots of people joining very quickly. Let's wait a few more minutes. <clears throat> Okay, I think we, we, we can start and maybe while we introduce uh, mm -hmm. the speaker, a few more people will, will join us. Uh, okay, hello, uh, good afternoon. Um, um, my, my name is Francesco Petruccione and um, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce to you to this afternoon this new uh, NITEP program that we called uh, uh, Mini School. Yeah, and the idea is uh, to have uh, for um, four lectures, one, one a week, uh, a prominent uh, speaker share some, some wisdom on a, on a topic that is uh, of interest to, to as many people as, as, as possible. Yeah, so I hope that uh, you will be with us not only today, but also the following three weeks <clears throat> to, to listen to uh, Professor Daniel Park who kindly offered to, to give the, the, the first mini school and he, who will probably then set the scene for all the forthcoming ones. Yeah? So Daniel, as I, as I mentioned, is based in, uh, in Korea at KAIST, the Korean Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, <clears throat> but he did his uh, undergraduate studies and, and his PhD uh, in Canada at the University of, um, of Waterloo. After that, he moved to, back to Korea, where he, he spent a few years as a, as a postdoc. And uh, since, uh, I don't remember, a year or two, he's a research professor at, uh, uh, at, at KAIST. Yeah. And, and Daniel has been working uh, on quantum computers since before there were quantum computers, so <laughs> for over, probably for over 10 years. Yeah. And uh, so he, he will be a very good uh, teacher for, for those of you that maybe have not yet had uh, a first uh, impact and a first uh, experience in, uh, in, in, in accessing and maybe even programming uh, a quantum computer. So Daniel, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first speaker in our mini school series. Yeah? We are all very excited to, to listen to what you will have to share, yeah? And please don't be shy to <clears throat> not assign homeworks to the listeners so that maybe we can keep them busy a little bit between today and next week, yeah? So Daniel, please, over to you. People are not here to listen to me. They're here to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, for uh, inviting me to this great, uh, exciting event. And thank you very much for your kind introduction. So, I mean, it's my great pleasure to be here. I mean, not, not, not physically there, but here in this cyberspace <laughs> to be able to interact with all of you and to, to speak about uh, quantum computing. So should I, uh, okay, so I, sh I should share my screen. So yes, see. yes, please, please go ahead. And um, so that, um, yeah. Okay. So do you see do you see my uh, slide? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so yeah. So um, so so for the next uh, for, for 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 the next month, uh, I'll give a series of tutorials or or lectures on the introduction to the theory of quantum computing. So as you already know, there will be four lectures on, on this. And um, I mean, this uh, quantum computing is really, really uh, broad, but uh, for, for the next uh, four lectures, I'll just give an introduction and it will mainly be focused on the, on the theoretical aspects of, of quantum computing. 
Um, and you, you see my uh, email address. So if you, uh, if you have any questions, of course, please don't be shy to ask questions during, during the lectures. Uh, and also feel free to contact me after uh, uh, the tutorial if, if, uh, if you have any questions afterwards. Okay, so uh, before I really sorry, go into the details, let me first uh, give you some references. Oh, and, and also, and also uh, feel free to, I don't know, take some screen, screenshots if, uh, in the middle of the lecture if you need to. So first, uh, let me just give you some reference. Say if you want to really, because I mean, these, uh, these lectures will be kind of uh, brief and fast, and I probably won't have time to go into uh, great details. So if you want to look into more details, you can look into these books. And also there are uh, like a great course notes that I listed here. And of course there are more. There, there, there are many uh, good references out there, but these are just some examples where you can start from, okay? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, there will be four lectures, uh, one in each week in July. Uh, so basically part one is today. So, so, so basically uh, first uh, lecture will be about like what and why? What is quantum computing and why do we care about it? Why, why do we do quantum computing? And in part two, which is gonna be second, third and fourth week, uh, I'll, I'll discuss like how, I'll, I'll address the question of how, like how do we uh, realize the idea of quantum computation as quantum circuit and how do we design quantum algorithms with some examples and how do we reliably do quantum computation using the, the idea of quantum error correction? Okay. Okay, so uh, today I'm just gonna go give you uh, some introduction and background. Okay, so uh, what is quantum information processing? So I would say uh, two of the most uh, interesting and revolutionary developments of the 20th century are uh, quantum mechanics, uh, which uh, revolutionized the way uh, we, we understand the nature, and information science, which also has uh, had a significant impact in our lives in, in many uh, aspects. And quantum, quantum information processing is basically uh, a field that converges this, this two. Uh, just to be a little bit more specific with words, uh, quantum information processing is really the result of using the laws of quantum physics to perform information processing tests that were previously believed impossible or infeasible. Okay, and uh, actually this, this quantum information processing spans over uh, many different disciplines like physics, computer science, math, engineering, and even philosophy. So actually just to tell you a little bit more about myself, I, I have a physics background. So maybe my, my lectures could be a little bit uh, biased uh, as a physicist. Uh, perspective, but hopefully uh, you're all okay with that. And also uh, in the field of quantum information processing, uh, it could be broken down into three uh, subfields. One is uh, quantum computation, and there is also quantum communication and cryptography, and also there's a quantum sensing. But uh, in this mini school, I will just focus on the computation aspect of quantum information processing. So we'll just discuss how, uh, how could we use the, the, the laws of quantum physics to, do, uh, to carry out computational tests, okay? Um, okay, so what is there to do with uh, physics and information science? Uh, for information to be useful, 
uh, it must be stored in some physical medium and manipulated by some physical process. This sounds quite uh, straightforward. But, but now this uh, implies that when we do information processing, the laws of physics ultimately dictates the capabilities of any information processing machine, right? So uh, it's, it's natural to consider the laws of physics when we study the theory of information processing in computation. And we all know that uh, classical computation that, that we're all familiar with is based on classical mechanics. But we also know that uh, classical mechanics uh, is really a special uh, limit of quantum mechanics. We, we, know, we know that quantum theory is, is better theory than classical mechanics. Okay, so, so naively, we want to think that quantum computers can only be better than classical computers. So uh, to me, it's a natural attempt to build a computer based on quantum mechanics because quantum theory is, a, is known to be better theory than classical mechanics. Okay, so it seems like there is a very natural connection between um, quantum physics and this information science. Um, and also we, uh, we have, we actually have a long uh, history of uh, developing algorithms and devices that, that we can program to uh, solve certain problems. Um, and so, so basically, so, so, so this is really like a, uh, like a fundamental uh, task that, that, you know, we as human have been uh, thinking about. And, and a fundamental question is, uh, when you're given a problem, is this problem uh, computable? And if so, how much resource do we need? So these are really fundamental questions uh, in, in, in computer science. And actually this is not uh, very easy to answer, but uh, in, in 1930s, we, we know uh, Alan Turing, he was a, a great computer, like he, he was basically, basically the father of more modern computer science. And, uh, and there is this strong church Turing thesis. So basically, actually like uh, strong church Turing thesis is, is not from uh, um, uh, Alan the Church and uh, Alan Turing, but you know, they first came up with church Turing thesis and later, uh, you know, many people afterwards, they kind of uh, uh, revised the church Turing thesis to come up with strong church Turing thesis. So basically what it says is that um, a probabilistic Turing machine, uh, which is a Turing machine with a coin flip. And if you don't know what Turing machine is, this is basically a model of uh, modern computation. And then this could be thought of as an abstract, some, some abstract machine, which basically is like a primitive version of modern computers, okay? And, and so, so, so this Turing machine uh, with the ability to randomize can efficiently simulate any realistic model of computing, okay? So uh, you, at first glance, uh, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're not from computer science, you may not uh, immediately recognize the significance of this, uh, this thesis, but this is actually really, really important because uh, you know, just to go back and ask this fundamental question, we, we want to figure out if the problem is solvable and if it's solvable, how much computational resource we need. Um, this is really uh, a problem that's intrinsic to, to the computational problem itself, but uh, it could vary, uh, depends on the specific computing model or specific computing architecture. Um, so in order to answer this question um, as an intrinsic property of a problem itself, all we need to do is to see if uh, it can be solved in, uh, with a Turing machine. 
and whether it could be solved efficiently with Turing machine. So if it could be solved efficiently with Turing machine, then, then we know that such problem can be also solved efficiently in any, uh, any realistic uh, model of computing and any, any realistic uh, computing architecture. Okay. Uh, but so so what? But now, uh, what do we uh, mean by uh, if, um, efficiency? Um, so I, I already mentioned that when we when we look at these computational problems, we want to look look at uh, intrinsic complexity of the problems. But uh, it could it could depend on on. The model of computing or the computing architecture. Like for example, uh, we, uh, you want to solve the same problem using your laptop from 10 years ago and your laptop that you have now, then you will see obvious difference in performance. Um, so, like now, so, so we really want to analyze this difficulty of solving computational problem independent from a uh, specific architecture of the computer, okay? So for that, we need to introduce some sort of uh, uh, more coarse measure. And for that, it's quite useful to use this big O notation. So basically, what it says is for a given problem size, what's the, what's the the computational cost. And then basically we're just looking at the leading order term and, it's, and just see how the leading order term for the computational cost scales with the size of the problem. And we, uh, we, we say the, the algorithm is efficient if the computational cost scales polyno polynomially with the problem size. So in this example, uh, all, all this, we, 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 we call them, uh, these are efficient, but this uh, algorithm here, which scales, wh whose computation cost scales exponentially with the problem size, we, we, we say this is not efficient, okay? Okay, um, but now uh, there is a fundamental motivation uh, for quantum computing. So, so, so just now I, I, I told you about this strong church Turing thesis. So when we want to know the complexity of given problem, we just need to check whether it can be solved efficiently with a probabilistic Turing machine. But now this quantum computing challenges uh, the strong church Turing thesis. And the reason is as follows. Uh, uh, the reason is because this classical computer is not powerful enough to efficiently simulate quantum computer. Um, and um, so uh, this, this quantum computer is a real, realistic model of computation, but it turns out that this probabilistic Turing machine cannot uh, simulate this computer efficiently. Okay, so we need so this tells us that we need a computing model that's capable of uh, simulating arbitrary realistic physical device. So, so there's, there's a gap between this structure theory thesis and, and quantum computing. So, and we, we, this is a very famous quote from, from Feynman. You know, uh, if we want to really simulate the nature, we need to make computer quantum mechanical. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the, 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 the strong church Turing thesis deals with a realistic model of computation. So of course, uh, one would ask, okay, uh, church Turing, uh, the Turing, probabilistic Turing machine cannot simulate quantum computing, but is it really a realistic machine? Then it turns out that quantum computing in principle, in theory, it's a realistic model of computation. Okay. And also, uh, uh, another um, um, uh, person who kind of gave uh, birth to the, the field of quantum computing is uh, David Deutsch, and he also uh, he was also really 
thinking about uh, how to study the computational complexity of problems. And he was really thinking what should be, uh, you know, when, when, when somebody, when, when one studies computational complexities, uh, there has to be a reference of uh, a set of uh, uh, the laws of physics that has to serve as a reference. And then he was really thinking that quantum, quantum physics should be, I mean, I mean it's, it's more complete theory than classical physics. So it should be a reference for studying the computational complexity. So, so, so there are some fundamental motivations to, to study quantum computing. Um, so as, an, as an, an, an example that shows that uh, uh, the quantum computing is much more powerful than uh, classical computing, which could be efficiently simulated by a uh, probabilistic Turing machine is Shor's uh, factoring algorithm. And it turns out uh, that uh, if you want to multiply two numbers together, it's, it can be done efficiently with a classical computer. However, if you want to factor, it's, it's really difficult. So let's say we're given some number n, which is a product of two prime numbers. Uh, this Shor's uh, factoring problem is to find these two prime numbers, p and q, when you're given n, okay? And because this problem is, uh, is, is really hard to solve with classical computers, this problem is actually a basis for uh, RSA uh, crypto system, which is uh, it's, uh, commercially important cryptography, okay? Um, However, uh, Peter Shore, he, he showed that if we uh, try to solve this factoring problem with quantum computer, it could be done efficiently. So this was actually like a first quantum algorithm to tackle an important problem that is computationally hard classically. So this is just, this is, uh, one example that compares uh, the computational resource that you need to solve uh, this factoring problem if you're given a classical computer or a quantum computer. And, uh, and in, for, for modern uh, RSA code, they're using uh, 1024 uh, bit uh, for, uh, for their encryption. And then, and then I, I think they're slowly moving to uh, 2048, and you can already see that with classical computer in this regime, I mean, this is a rough estimate, but this is already like reaching the age of universe. So this, I mean, this problem can be solved, but it's just uh, the time scale of uh, how long it takes, it's just not uh, realistic, okay? Um, but with quantum computer, uh, it could be done in hours, okay? Um, but you know, you, you might also say that, okay, but, but we, but we don't have a quantum computer now and you, maybe it will take 20 years, 30 years from now to have a quantum computer that can really break RSA code. So for me, uh, it doesn't really matter. And also at the same time, uh, there is a field of what's called post quantum cryptography where people try to come up with uh, different uh, uh, crypto uh, systems, uh, which cannot be uh, broken by quantum computer, okay? So you, you might argue that, okay, so this is not so impressive, but you know, you, you also have to realize that uh, maybe the eavesdropper would, could, uh, store your information, your current information somewhere, and then, which, which is encrypted by this RSA scheme. And then maybe uh, 20 years from now, once there, is, there, there, there are quantum computers that can break RSA code, uh, the eavesdropper could really uh, uh, break the code to, to get your sensitive information. So uh, 
so so people need to worry about this because some 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 information maybe it's not important anymore like you know 10 years from now 20 years from now maybe it's not important anymore however there are some there, there are information that they shouldn't be broken even after 20 years so so people should worry about this okay uh but anyway it's like I didn't want to go too much about this uh, cryptography, but I just wanted to just uh, give you one example where uh, for, where the problem is really hard to solve classically, but it could be solved easily uh, using quantum computer. So it seems like it violates uh, the strong charge during thesis. Okay. So uh, we. So now, uh, one of the following scenarios should be correct, and and actually, like any of these uh, scenarios, uh, is is really exciting and interesting. So first, uh, first scenario is that practical quantum computation is really possible, so which would be really revolutionary because we could really solve some problems that's really hard to solve or which we believed impossible to solve with classical computers could be solved with quantum computers, okay? So that's very nice scenario. But uh, the second scenario is that maybe uh, scalable quantum computing is impossible for some fundamental reason, okay? Then this is actually also interesting because uh, as far as how we understand quantum mechanics, in principle, it should be possible to build a scalable quantum computer. So if this is fundamentally impossible, then something about our understanding of quantum mechanics is not right. So that's also very uh, interesting. And finally, maybe a strong church Turing thesis was correct and classical computing can efficiently simulate quantum mechanics. So this is also very exciting. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so, for these fundamental reasons, I think uh, quantum computing is very uh, exciting to, to study. But also there are some technological motivations. So you might be familiar with uh, this Moore's law. Basically, uh, I mean, it was predicted by Gordon Moore, who is the, the founder of Intel. Uh, he predicted that the computing power basically would Roughly speaking, it, it will increase exponentially in, in time. And then it turns out that his prediction was amazingly, uh, it, it fitted really well. Um, however, uh, so basically in order to increase the computing power, you just have, you, one has to make transistors smaller and smaller, okay? But then uh, there is a limit to this because uh, there is a limit to which you can you can make the transistors small uh, because well if the transistors becomes the size of uh, if it's like atomic scale then now you see quantum effects and then things don't work properly so so even um, Gordon Moore himself a couple of years ago he 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 said that he he thinks this uh, Moore's law will not be uh, uh, valid anymore. Um, yeah, and I think uh, I think nowadays we're talking about like uh, like a roughly speaking like three nanometer, five nanometer uh, fabrication techno uh, techniques for uh, for for transistors and. And that's already very close to the size of, uh, that, that's already like getting close to the size of silicon atoms. And, you know, it's, it's like in the scale of uh, uh, the distance between carbon, uh, the, the bond length of uh, carbon atoms and so on. So it's, it's really, uh, the, 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 the size of this, uh, these nano devices uh, it's, it's really approaching the, uh, the, the atomic scale, okay? So, I mean, these famous uh, physicists, they also uh, predicted such problems. So they, they also uh, thought about this, that, you know, uh, as we try to make 
transistor smaller and smaller, then we'll see uh, quantum effects and they'll be problematic. Okay, so now I, I know uh, not all of you are uh, from physics. Is that, is that correct? I mean, I, I, I don't see, I don't hear any feedback. So it's, it's hard to, it's really hard to <laughs> know everyone's background, but uh, uh, see, there are about 50 people. And I, 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 I assume not all of you are from physics background. So I, I, I would like to uh, explain a little bit on what, uh, what uh, what quantum physics is about? So uh, you know, you know the physics of what we see in our daily daily lives, uh, in our daily experience. I mean, I kind of mentioned this already, but uh, it's it's really based on classical physics, which has been which have been developed by you know people that, that you know very well, like a Newton, Galileo, and Maxwell, and so on. And also, you know, our current computing devices, they're also uh, based on uh, principles of classical physics, okay? But, uh, but this, is, this is what we uh, experience and what we see in macroscopic uh, scale. But the, the physics of what atoms see is actually very different. So, so when, we, when we go to atomic scale, the laws of physics uh, changed dramatically. Okay, so uh, as an example, so if you if, if you're from physics, you probably uh, know uh, this two slit experiment very well. But let's say uh, you have we have a, a particle. It could be like a single photon or or electron, and we we send it through uh, two slits. Okay. And, uh, with, and, then, and then what we want to do is we want to, we repeat this procedure many times and we want to gather statistics on the position where this particle lands. So this is a sum screen, okay? And our intuition says, okay, so the probability of, uh, for this particle to land a specific location is simply uh, the sum of the probability for this particle to go through this slit or that slit, okay? However, if we uh, actually do the experiment, we see something completely different, and it turns out that the probability uh, of observing uh, this particle at a certain location is actually not a simple sum of the two, okay? So this is very strange, but it turns out that uh, when we really look at the, the, the probability, then it appears as if this particle behaved like a wave, such that uh, when it goes through these two, two slits, it does not deterministically go through one or the other, but, but it has some extra term, which we, uh, we, we call uh, quantum interference, okay? So it appears as if this particle went through these two slits at the same time, just like how wave could do, okay? So this is one example where our usual intuition breaks down when we go to atomic scale. So another, another example, so this is, I mean, really this is exactly same example as what we, I mean, the, the, the underlying principle is exactly same as what we just discussed with this double slit experiment, but you know, the experimental setup appears slightly different, okay? So again, so we have a single photon source, and then we have a beam splitter. So we send it through this beam splitter, and then what this beam splitter does is basically, uh, it splits, it either uh, transmits or reflects 50-50%, okay? And then, um, so if uh, we put a detector here, and then if we try to measure uh, where uh, the, uh, the particle, the photon lands, uh, then we should just measure 50-50%. It's, it's, it's really straightforward. But now um, let's uh, change the setup a little bit. 
like this. Uh, okay, so now uh, it's the same setup. So we have a beam splitter, but now we have a mirror, and then we put second beam splitter. Okay, so you see uh, the, the, the particle go here 50% of the time, there 50% of the time. And now they combine here, and then this is exactly the same beam splitter as, as the one that we used here. So the particle again will be sent to this direction with 50% of chance and then 50% of chance of going there. So you would, I mean, our intuition says that if, if we measure, uh, if, if we measure, if we gather the statistics of where the photon uh, lands at the end of this uh, setup, then we should also again just see 50 50 percent. However, uh, it turns out that we always measure photon here 100 percent of the time. So, so this uh, is 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 very different from uh, our intuition. And then one can also uh, add a phase shifter there. Then, then you you get some probabilities like this. Okay, so so this is another example that uh, that. Uh, in atomic scale, our usual intuition breaks down, okay? Um, so, um, today, I, I, so I, I basically, I kind of gave you some, some basic, uh, really uh, basic idea on um, uh, how, how things are different when we go to atomic scale, okay? And uh, now I want to be a little bit more specific and I want to be a little bit more theoretical, like more rigorous to review quantum mechanics. Uh, and I actually, I'm not sure how you are familiar with quantum mechanics. Uh, so I, I don't know how much time I should spend on just reviewing quantum mechanics. Uh, and also I'm looking at time. Uh, we only have about 20 minutes now, so I'll try to go fast, but uh, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Daniel, there is a question from the audience, and the question is, uh, it's about the Moore's law, and it says, could the Moore's law totally nullify the speculation that the classical computation could simulate quantum systems? Uh, sorry, so I, uh, I couldn't, Understand. So uh, let me turn on the volume a little bit more so I understand better. So okay. I, I okay. know the question was a little on Moore's law, but I didn't get the actual mm -hmm. question. Okay. So could Moore's law totally nullify the speculation that classical computation could simulate quantum systems? Ah. So could Moore's law? Yeah. You, you um, should be able to see. You should be able to see the question in the Q and A button in the below. Ah, okay, oh. you are sharing your screen. Yes, you you can see from the. Could Moore's law totally nullify the speculation that classical computations could simulate quantum systems? Yes, that's the question. Uh, so, so Moore's law is not about. Uh, the computational complexity. So, so, so Moore's law is, is it really has to do with uh, the hardware. Okay, and it, it's basically it, it it's not really a law, but it's more like a prediction, right? That, that Gordon Moore made, and he he speculated that the size of transistors. I mean, like given given some area, like how many transistors. Can you fit in in a fixed area? And for that, you, if you want to uh, pack more uh, transistors in a given area, then you, you just have to make the transistor smaller. And then he was he was predicting that the size, the technology, like it was it was more about the predictions on how fast the technology can grow. So he was predicting the technology, uh, like this with, with these fabrications and so on. Uh, uh, the design of integrated circuits and so on would uh, uh, improve such that the size of transistors could 
uh, become smaller exponentially uh, in time. So this is not about the complexity of uh, pro uh, computational problem. And there is one more question. Is it's about your previous slide and it's what is C in the mirror oh, yeah, experiment? Yeah. So I, I, I kind of went really fast there, but phi is some uh, phase shifter that you can put in your optical setup. Uh, but I'll, I'll get back to it later, but basically it's a phase shifter. There is like a beam splitter and phase shifter in the photonic. Uh, do working quantum computers exist? The rumor is that IBM owns a quantum computer. So this is uh, not just a rumor, but they, they, they do have a quantum computer. And um, I mean, in, in principle, uh, there has been quantum computer for many years now, I think. I mean, in the beginning, uh, it was more in the, the level of uh, research lab, like, you know, some research labs, they would, they would have like PhD students and postdocs who like really uh, build like, you know, quantum like transistors uh, that acts like uh, quantum bits. But you know, the number of qubits were small, like they were like usually like less than 10. And then now uh, recently, I think in 2016, IBM, I mean, I, IBM also has been uh, working on quantum computing for a long time, not only on the hardware, but also, uh, uh, on the theoretical aspects of quantum computing for long, like they have a long history of working on quantum computing. And I think in 2016, they, uh, they put their quantum computer on cloud service such that uh, uh, public users can also have access to it and, and have opportunities to play around with it. So if you go, uh, if you're curious about it, I mean, you can go on, you can, you can search for IBM quantum experience but also uh, IBM is not the only uh, company who, who, who owns quantum computer. There is uh, Google, uh, Google also has one. There's also another company called Rigetti, uh, IMQ. So, so there, there are a handful of companies who owns quantum computer, but, and also, but, but it's not only owned by quantum computers. Some research labs, they also do have quantum computers. Um, okay, so I should continue. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if there's no more question, I'm, I'm gonna continue. Uh, I, okay, so now I see one more Q&A. Uh, so I'll just read out the question. I would imagine that the computation power of a classical computer should depend on the number of transistors that you have and Moore's laws is soon putting a limit to how many transistors you can have on a chip. And I would imagine simulating quantum systems require high computation power. So that's why, ah, okay, yeah, I mean, um, in that sense, I mean, so, I, I, I was saying uh, that the Moore's law would be nullified because there is a, yes, there is, there is a limit to how small these transistors can be, right? Because I mean, like, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there is a limit to the, the size of which can be, which can be. Like if it's too small, then it's gonna behave quantum mechanically and, and, then, and then things will break down. And also, I mean, um, for simulating quantum systems, it requires high computational power, uh, but that does not nullify Moore's law, but it basically says that, I mean, you can, you can, you can put, like, you can put a big, like a data center, like you can just uh, have a supercomputer. Like you don't necessarily have to uh, put all the transistors on, on a chip, like you can also parallelize. Right, but you know, it's it's more about uh, how how does the complexity of the problem scales with the problem size, and uh, I mean, I mean, it's it, 
and and in the end, uh, if the it, it could be it could still be solved with uh, classical computers, but it would just take too much time. So it won't be relevant to our lifetime. And then there's another question: How could we compare it for computer and quantum computing? Or they're totally different. What's the real? So, so it, the question is about comparing supercomputing and quantum computing. And uh, what is the real interest of quantum computing? Because summit is three gigahertz, while quantum computing is hundred megahertz. So, okay. So, um, I'll get back to this. So, I'll address this question later because I do have slide to uh, explain a little bit on this. Uh, because I mean, I really haven't really say anything about quantum computer. <laughs> so like once I start really talking about quantum computer, like you'll see more, you, you'll have better understanding. But just to give you a quick answer, quantum computer is, uh, and supercomputer, they are totally different. So they run on different sets of rules, okay? So supercomputer uh, is based on classical, uh, physics and quantum computer is based on quantum physics and then these are just different rules So you have to play a game with a different uh, set of rules. So now you change the rules and And things can be some things could be better, but some things could go worse. Okay so similar thing happens with quantum computer. So you uh, You uh, you go to you use a lot of quantum physics there is an advantage of using that, but there is also this advantage of using that, okay? So uh, just to make another uh, analogy, I mean, I would say like, I don't know, like a candle and a light bulb, uh, they, they are completely, they're based on completely different technology. So, so, so light bulb is not just a better candle, right? So quantum computer is not just a better supercomputer, but they, they basically, they are completely different technology. Okay, so I, I, I think I, uh, I should continue and because I only have about 10 minutes and I ha have many slides. Okay, uh, by the way, these are all very nice questions. So yeah, feel free to continue to put these questions in Q&A and then I'll try to address them later. Um, so I, I wanted to review quantum mechanics, but I'll just do very, I'll do it very, very quickly because I, we run out of time. So, uh, when we do, when we, when we think about computation, we really have to, uh, uh, when, when we think of quantum computing, we, we, uh, we think about, uh, preparing quantum state and we think about how these quantum states evolve in time. So that's the dynamics of quantum states and then the measurement. So, so these, in the language of computation, these would correspond to like input and the function and output, okay? So we, we really need to understand how we do the preparation of a quantum state and how quantum states evolve in time and how the quantum measurement works, okay? So, so these are explained by postulates of quantum mechanics, which I will mention just now. But before I mention postulates of quantum mechanics, uh, it, it's useful to introduce an abstract notion of how we represent quantum information. And for that, we use uh, what's called qubit. Maybe you've heard about, you, you heard this term before. So qubit is a uh, universal quantum information, uh, very similar to, to bits in classical computing. And, and usually, so this is not perfectly precise, but, but for now, for our purpose, it's okay to, to consider a qubit as a two-level quantum system. So for example, it could be some atomic system, or it could be some uh, uh, polarization degree of freedom of, uh, of a photon, or it could also be spin degree of freedom of, of, a, of a particle in magnetic field. Or, uh, so, so these, these exist uh, in nature, but, but we can also make a quantum mechanical, we can also devise a quantum mechanical system. Like we can, we can make an artificial quantum, mecha quantum mechanical system. 
by creating some sort of a, um, a LC circuit in a special way, uh, such that we have uh, uh, we, we can we can quantize the magnetic flux. Okay, so these are some examples, and we, these are some physical examples where we can uh, we, we can use to represent quantum information. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's go to a postulates of quantum mechanics. So for any isolated physical system is completely described by state vector. And what's important here is, is that, um, uh, so the dimension uh, of uh, this quantum system, okay? So let's say we have n quantum bits, uh, the, the state space of this quantum state uh, grows exponentially with the number of quantum bits, okay? And uh, we, we, we use the rock notation to represent these uh, quantum bits. Uh, so, you know, uh, when, when you have n qubits, I mentioned that there are exponentially many possibilities. So it will be really tedious to write them down, but there is this notation that use only n bits to represent this, uh, this vector of two to the n elements. Okay, this is a Dirac notation. So for example, for one qubit, you can, we, we usually represent a wave function that, that describes this one qubit as follows. So this is really in superposition of being uh, zero and one with some uh, probability amplitudes. These are a complex number and they have to satisfy normalization conditions. So these are just uh, basic uh, postulates of quantum mechanics if you are familiar with them. And then dynamics, I'll just be very brief. Uh, I mean, dynamics of quantum system is described by Schrodinger equation. So this is like a continuous version of uh, uh, quantum dynamics, but for quantum computation, it's also useful to have a discrete version because later we'll see uh, that we'll, we'll see a quantum circuit model where uh, the dynamics are represented at quantum gates, and there will be a discrete number of gates that represent uh, quantum dynamics. Uh, so, for a uh, time-independent Hamiltonian, um, it's it's easy to write down this unitary operator, but basically the time evolution of closed quantum system can also be written in this discrete. Um, and the measurement, um, oh, what's important here is that the measurement is also described as a set of uh, operators that acts on the state space. And uh, if, the, if we perform a measurement, then we get some probabilistic outcome, and then the, the 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 probability to measure specific outcome depends on the state and also the, the measurement operator. And then what's important here is that once we make a make measurement, the state could change. Okay. So uh, there are two key uh, points in quantum measure, measurement. Uh, measurement postulate of quantum mechanics uh, is that the measurements are probabilistic. You, you measure your wave function, you measure your qubit, you get some probabilistic outcome. And then there is a back action because you make a measurement and then the state changes. Okay, um, for example, the measurement operators can be written like this. So this is just saying you want to project your state to zero or you, you want to measure one. And suppose that you, you're given a, a one qubit state in this form. <coughs> and now the probability, like once we perform a measurement, you either measure zero or one, but there is a probability associated with them. So the probability to measure zero is basically a uh, modulus squared of this amplitude. Uh, and then after you make a measurement, your state, uh, becomes this. Similarly, the probability to measure one is modulus square of this probability amplitude. And after you make a measurement, your state changes, okay? And then, and then these, these are, uh, there is some phase, but you can, you can ignore them. And this is also known as a measurement in the computational basis. Okay, so now uh, what happens if, uh, so, so far I kind of uh, 
limited the discussion to a single qubit. Um, but now what happens if we have more than uh, one? Then uh, the state space of this composite physical system is described by the tensor product. Okay, so for example, you have two qubits, and then you want to uh, describe these two, two qubits together, then basically you, you create a tensor product of these two, okay? And then using the direct notation, you can, you can write it like this. Uh, but now uh, some composite quantum systems, quantum states cannot be written in the product form like this. So now there are m qubits, and then uh, this is a pro what we call is a product form of m qubits. We you know kind of just put them in a tensor product form. Uh, for example, a state like this. I mean, the, the state space is still living in the tensor product space of two qubits, but this state itself cannot simply be factored out in this form. <coughs> okay. And then we say the quantum state that can be written in the product form is separable. And then we say the quantum state that is not separable, like, like this one, is entangled. And the entanglement basically describes correlation between quantum systems that cannot be described with classical physics. And now you see, uh, you, s you can kind of see why entanglement would be important here. So now you, we have m qubits. So we uh, already mentioned that when we're given m qubits, the state space is exponential. So it will be like two to the m, right? But now, uh, if you look at this, how it's written, this is written in tensor product form, and you see each qubit can be described by uh, two parameters, okay? You, you can kind of see like, you know, like alpha and beta describes, parameterizes uh, this qubit, sorry, okay? So for each qubit, when it's written as a product form, you, you uh, you just need two parameters, two, two numbers to describe uh, this state. So, so it's only two times m numbers that you need to describe this state. So which is actually easy to do with classical computer, right? So now you see, I mean, even though the state space is really large, without using entanglement such that we cannot break down the state in this product form, unless we, we use entanglement um, uh, out of this large Hilbert space, we only have an access to very small subspace of, of a large Hilbert space, such that this small subspace could be described efficiently with classical computer, okay? So if there is no entanglement, then probably there is no real advantage. But however, once you really have an entangled system, then you really need to have two to the m, like exponentially many number of uh, parameters to describe your, sp your state. And, 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 and that's really hard to do with classical computer. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, for now, um, so maybe I'll get back to this later because I'm really behind the time. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to this because, because we also have a lecture next week. I'll try to get back to this uh, later. I'm going to basically skip uh, very, almost everything, but now uh, let me show you this. Okay, so I, I uh, with uh, this this uh, state postulate, I mentioned uh, that the number of, uh, that the dimension of the state space grows exponentially with the number of qubits. So you can see like, you know, when you have a one qubit, uh, there are two complex numbers to describe one qubit. When you have two qubits, there are four complex numbers to describe two qubits. Three qubits, you need eight complex numbers to describe three qubits, okay? So now when you have 70 qubits, uh, you have a quantum computer with 70 qubits, let's say, 
then you can process uh, 10 to the 21 complex amplitudes in parallel, okay? And if we just assume it takes one byte, just, you know, just roughly assume one byte for uh, representing one complex number, and then if we convert this to the number that we are familiar with, this is the like the 10 to the nine terabyte, okay? So, I mean, this is already, I mean, so, so this is like a zettabyte, but I mean, I, I kind of want you to write in, in, in the unit that's, that's more familiar to all of us. So, I mean, you can already see that in order to represent or simulate the behavior of 70 qubits, it's already really pushing the limit of the current uh, technology of uh, supercomputers, okay? However, uh, you really have to be careful here. Like, you know, we, uh, we have to really be careful because uh, as we, as I discussed, when you, you can do this parallel computation, but in the end, we make a measurement and the measurement basically uh, could destroy this quantum superposition and it will basically collapse. Uh, it will basically, it has a back action, right? As I mentioned, so it will change your state. Okay, so it could be that, you know, we have 70 qubits such that we have 10 to nine terabytes of information and we, we, we work with, we, we try to uh, design some algorithms such that uh, the state, at least one of them is the solution to the problem. But it also means that there are exponentially many wrong answers, right? So when you make a measurement, uh, probabilistically it gives you one of you know, exponentially many outcomes and it's, it's high, highly likely that it's a wrong answer. So it seems like, okay, so what do we do? It's, it sounds uh, very bad, but however, uh, it turns out we can use uh, this quantum interference uh, to, to have uh, really like a strong exponential advantage. So basically uh, the idea we'll, we'll also see later that uh, quantum computers could be good for, as, as for example, for, uh, for finding patterns uh, out of these many numbers. So, uh, I mean, the, the idea of quantum computing and quantum algorithm is to uh, design uh, and engineer these quantum states and quantum interference such that uh, the answer that we're looking for uh, has the higher high probability to be measured in the end. Uh, so, uh, because, because these are, unlike, uh, unlike classical computing, these are uh, probability amplitudes with complex numbers. These could be, these could add up or, so this could like constructively uh, interfere or destructively interfere. So, so this could add up or subtract from another. So they can, you know, we can design an algorithm such that certain probabilities really add up. Uh, okay, so, so really the, the problem of quantum computing, the art of quantum computing is to really engineer quantum interference in the right way. Okay, um, I'm almost done. So let me just mention to you, uh, there are two theoretical pillars for quantum computing. One is quantum algorithm, which I will discuss in the week three. And then also there is a quantum error correction, which I'll discuss in the week four. Um, so quantum algorithm basically tells us uh, that uh, there, there is an advantage of using uh, quantum physics for doing computational tasks. And, and quantum error correction tells us that imperfection, imperfections are not the fundamental objections to, to quantum computation. Okay? But, but these are all uh, theory. And if we really want to uh, put this in practice, we need quantum hardware. Uh, so, uh, so since this mini school is on the theory of quantum computing, I won't say too much of quantum hardware, but uh, let me finish by just giving you a rough idea of where we are at now. Um, so uh, we, can, um, we can benchmark 
the performance of quantum hardware uh, using a uh, number of qubits and the error rate, okay? So these are kind of uh, very coarse uh, measure. And so roughly speaking today, uh, we are like, you know, roughly speaking, you know, uh, 20, 50 qubit, because, you know, uh, recently Google did 53 qubit experiment. Um, and the error rate is something around like 1% or higher. Okay. And later I'll discuss in detail, but there is a fault. Um, um, there is what's called threshold theorem uh, that says when we uh, build uh, the real device, if the physical error rate of this device is below certain uh, threshold value, then by using uh, the technique of quantum error correction to suppress this error using uh, imperfect controls uh, to build a scalable quantum computer. Okay, uh, so that's around here. So the, the ultimate goal is to push the error rate below this error correction threshold. Okay, um, and uh, in order to uh, implement uh, Shor's factoring algorithm that I mentioned earlier to break the current RSA code, uh, we need to go down probably around this level. So which we believe, because we are still here today, this is gonna be far future, we think. However, uh, we think that uh, roughly this area is uh, uh, reachable in the near term. And uh, this is it's called noisy intermediate scale quantum. So the error rate is still kind of high and the number of qubits is still not too large. However, as I showed before, the number of qubits is large enough that it is hard to simulate the behavior of such quantum computer using classical computing. Okay, so uh, definitely we are living in a very uh, exciting era and I think uh, there are enough reasons to study uh, and work on quantum uh, computing. Okay, so um, I think I'll end here for now and we'll I'll, I'll take some questions for now and we can also continue next week. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel, for the very nice introduction to the, to the field of, uh, of quantum computing and uh, and, and surroundings. Maybe while our participants can think about questions, uh, I just uh, share the result of, of, of our poll, just uh, because it's interesting to know um, where, where, where our attendees come from. Yeah, and roughly two thirds of the participants have a physics background, uh, roughly one third is from mathematics, we have a few participants from computer science and a few from other. Sorry, I, in the heat of the action, I just uh, gave you three options and other. So I apologize for whoever is in the category other. Yeah. And also the, the, the kind of academic level, we have um, uh, a small number of undergraduate students, uh, almost three quarters are postgraduate students. We have a few postdocs and even a few, almost a handful of, of lecturers. Yeah, so that's uh, the, 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 the breakdown is, is, is very interesting and I'm very happy about that. And around three quarter of, of, of the participants have already uh, some kind of background in, uh, in, in, in quantum theory. Yeah, so um, that's the, the background of the, <laughs> of the audience of, of today. Yeah, so the, that's quite, uh, quite interesting. Ilya, are there still unanswered questions? Uh, right now, no. We, we answered uh, a few, but yes, yes. right now there is no, no more questions. Uh, other I, questions I, from, from I, the I, audience, I, please, I, you're so the, welcome. Uh, since, since it's not so many of us, you're also welcome 
to 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 raise your hand and 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 I can allow you then to to speak for a little while. Yeah, uh, unless you, if if you prefer. Ah, there is one in one new question that just came up. Uh huh. So uh, this question is about. Can you please describe the process of measurement? Um, yeah, I guess that was one of the slides that were uh, where you um, discussed very, very rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think probably the question is: Is this question more about uh, how to make connections to like a physical implementations or? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess for now I was trying to, I mean, I was trying to explain it with, uh, with equations, but you can, you can consider, uh, maybe one example is that uh, you have, uh, you have a spin system, okay? And um, the, what you could uh, measure so let's say you have a spin and you put the spin in magnetic field, so it's either up or down, but it could be a superposition of up or down, right? Or with, with some, some probabilities of being up or some probabilities of being down, but in, in superposition, okay? And then now if you, um, okay, so let me maybe just use this. So you can, uh, you can so so we can you can we can model the probability to to measure the spin state using these operators, and then you can consider the zero as a as a spin state being up, and then one is spin down, like for, as, as as an example, right? And your state is either spin up or down in superposition, and then you you perform a measurement, um, and then in, 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 for physical implementations, there are, there are many there are different ways of measuring spin states. Uh, so how does the magnetic field for measurement translate to a math operator? Um, so I mean you, you could you could express uh, these zeros and ones as also um, uh, uh, could you not yes uh, so uh, let's see uh, I mean, you, you could also represent the state of being uh, spin up using this matrix. Uh, this matrix would represent, um, you know, uh, the state that is being spin, spin up, or this would be the matrix that describes the spin being down. But we don't have, uh, I mean, this, these, these are flexible, right? right? I mean, this could also represent uh, like horizontal polar polarization or uh, vertical polarization. We use these math mathematical operators to, uh, as an abstract tool uh, that gives us the freedom to use them to represent um, any two-level systems. So it's not only limited to the spins in magnetic field, but, but it, it could be uh, used to describe spins in magnetic field. I mean, these are the basis for um, uh, uh, sorry, not the basis, but these these uh, and then now I'm not sure. Oh, okay, so 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 it's okay. Good. Okay. Ilya, are there more questions? Not right now. Okay. So who are the other two? There are two students or two uh, participants who are not physics, computer science, or math. Yes. And, and, and we don't know, and what, is, but maybe next and there time. Is, there is a question. Ah. How can simulate quantum algorithms on classical computers? Recently, there is a lot of research going on quantum machine learning. How did they simulate their quantum algorithms? For instance, quantum 
variational uh, Monte Carlo. Um, I mean, you can you can simulate quantum algorithms because um, I mean, you you see how uh, we can represent. So let me go maybe here. So first of all, you can definitely represent quantum states using classical vectors. It's just that in order to in order to write down a quantum state. The, 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 you know, the, the numbers that you have to write down, like you can, you can write it on a paper, but the numbers you write down just you know, increases exponentially with the number of qubits. So it becomes more and more tedious to, to write all of them down. But uh, basically you can, you can represent the quantum state as high, dimen high dimensional vectors. And now uh, the, the quantum algorithms We'll later see. Uh, we'll see in the later lectures can be represented as quantum circuits with uh, uh, quantum gates, and these great gates could be uh, represent written down as a unitary matrix which describes the evolution of quantum state by postulates of quantum mechanics. So you see, uh, this unitary matrix is is also a square matrix, right? So so with, with hands, we can also write them down, right? It's just that the numbers that we have to write down scales, you know, increases exponentially, right? So we can do, we can write down the state. We can write down how the, how the algorithm changes the quantum state. And then we can also, because now this is a vector, this is a matrix, this is also, uh, this is column vector matrix, uh, row vector. So we can do the matrix multiplication. So this is all like linear algebra. So you can do linear algebra to, to simulate quantum algorithms. It's just that the numbers that you have to write down scales exponentially with number of qubits. Um, and there is another question. Could you please recommend a book list on quantum computing? So I think for that I should just go back and show you this page. So this is the slide that I had in the beginning. You can take a screenshot. So it's so there are more, but but these are some some examples. Okay, I would say, uh, say thank you very much, Daniel, for, for, for answering all the, all the questions. And um, since we've gone a little bit uh, over time and I can see that uh, some of the participants left us already, which is the typical phenomenon that happens after an hour in, in Zoom, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I, I would suggest that we, that we, that, that we stop here for, for today. And, and that we meet again uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a week's time. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, we, will, we will send out uh, a reminder in, in, in due course, but I'm sure that all of you have already put the next uh, talk of, of Daniel in, the, um, in, in, in your respective diaries. And uh, you know, this, this, this mini school is just an introduction. Yeah? So if, uh, if, we, if you let us know that there is interest in, uh, in having uh, deeper insights in, uh, in quantum computation and, and related uh, areas, we can uh, easily organize uh, mini schools that, that focus more on some specific aspect and maybe go into a little bit more, more, more detail. Yeah? Uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> please think about questions for next week. And if they are very urgent, you're welcome to, to e email da Daniel or to email me or Ilya, and we will make a plan to come back to you with, uh, with the corresponding answers. Yeah? So Daniel, again, thank you so much for, for your time. I know that much. it's uh, quite, quite late now in, uh, in Korea. So thank you very much for, <laughs> for sacrificing your sleep for us. Yeah? That's really thank much. Uh, much much appreciated yeah and uh, and we will uh, we will see you again latest uh, in in a week's time and to all the participants thank you very much as well for for joining us and please um, keep interacting with us and um, and we hope to see you all 
next week. And if you know of people that missed us today, please tell them to, to, to watch the lecture of Daniel on YouTube. We will post it uh, just now so that um, even if you missed the first lecture, you will be able to join us for the, for the second, for the rest of the course. So to all of you, a, a good afternoon and thank you very much for, for being with us today. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Bye again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ilya, for the questions. <clears throat>